So like 2 million subscribers one year. I think, how many did you get in the first four months? I think it was like 700,000 subscribers in, yes. a, in a few months. We, I hit a million in six months, or in five months. What was that like for you? And where did that audience come from? Was that Ben's um, audience navigating over to you because maybe there's a bit of a resemblance? I or think is initially, it initially, like, yes. So okay. we did not do any paid ads for my channel at all. Um, in fact, we did a very, or Daily Wire did a very, very soft marketing campaign. Like there was barely anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember in my pitch with Jeremy, when we like brought the show in front of him, he didn't even know really who I was at the time. Mm. And the CMO had brought me on and I was like, hey, I'm the little kid that's here trying to, you know, get a show approved. And he watched the pilot, which was so bad. And he looked at me and he said, I don't understand the show. It's not for me, but I know it's for somebody else. It's not really for our audience, but I know it's going to reach somebody else. So let's try it. And I mean, literally through us, like a few grand to put together a set took some team members from like our social video t video team and we're like just try it and see what happens um so i did my own promotion on my like social video channel or my social media channels and i had been doing like some daily wire videos like news hits and that sort of thing so i think i was probably up to like twenty thousand like followers at okay, that point sure. i still didn't have a youtube channel so there were some people who knew who i was in the daily wire circle and then i did one hit on ben's show and announced the show and that was it i don't think any of the other hosts talked about it candace didn't even know that i had a show hmm. or who i was for like six months because nobody told her yep um we literally it was like a trial and error they did not put any paid or anything um so i think some of it migrated over and you know daily wire would repost me every once in a while so i think the initial like bulk i would say maybe mm -hmm. under a hundred thousand came from the daily wire audience um but then it's just been where did the rest come from was that just a series of videos that you posted that did yeah. well like yeah what was the what and shorts shorts yeah okay i mean we that was not something i really knew a lot about but i was already doing a ton of organic content for instagram and TikTok, and so that made its way to youtube and one thing i think i've done differently is that all of my shorts content was original mm -hmm. it wasn't clips from the show it wasn't anything like that it was all like this is designed for hmm. yeah youtube or so for youtube shorts. in the beginning how did you pick topics to talk about is this on you or yeah. would they would they come to you ever and it still like, is on me still so on i okay. create the show i pick the topics i pull all the comments if there's anything that i want to write sometimes it's off the cuff um these days i'll kind of have like bullet points of points i want to hit if there's a message that i want to leave people with sometimes i'll write that out if it feels a little more touchy but it still is pretty improvised um and i just research the subject really well and i try to become an expert on that like one little thing every day mm -hmm and then share it. So I still do all of that. Um, but it was basically just living on social media and it still is. And so most of my content is social media heavy. I will only cover something if it is like trending on social media or if I notice that it's about to. So mm -hmm. that can mean like literally trending on Twitter or if it's a trend on TikTok that is like sure. picking up or a thing in society that has, you know, whether it's a social media trend or just a trend in general in the original sense of the word. Um, and so I would find things through there. And then, you know, it's called the comment section. That was kind of the, the get of the show and the angle mm -hmm. was that I wasn't just like talking about a subject, just my opinions, but I was going into the comments and actually trying to get people's actual opinions about it. Yeah. So I'd get people on both sides of the aisle, um, on both, you know, sides of whatever issue I was talking about and read those comments. And it was fun to, you know, kind of act them out and use my act, you know, acting background and make it really, really fun. Um, and then I wanted it to be really, really punchy because I know my generation, I know that I hate watching long form content because mm -hmm. our attention spans are dead due to TikTok. So it was very, very fast paced. So I wanted like memes like we had our first, you know, editing run. It was like, we need more. It was like more cowbell, like more memes, no, like really. more fast cuts. Grim. I hate that. Yeah. yeah. But it works. I, I mean, that's like, that's what my generation yeah. needs. It's like, I need so my I'm attention. Saying. Yeah. I'm it. saying. Yeah. He always rejects it. I watch it. my own TikToks, like sound effects, sound effects, zoom in. That's what I love. Be real over here. Sound effects, sound effects. I'm like, I mean, I wish why? I, I, wish I didn't works. love it. But it works. But for, yeah, yeah. for young people, it's what we are. The text on screen. Yep. You got to yeah. have so many things flying. So we really like worked very hard on creating that, you know, that style. And then I wanted, you know, the comments were kind of a unique thing. And then obviously that I was going to be, you know, more right leaning was a different thing because there wasn't really anybody in that space that was doing this kind of like laid back cultural commentary streamery type stuff. It was really on the right. That was my age. Yeah. Because it's like there's a lot of them that are, you know, 35 year old dudes. But like a 19 year old girl, like that's not really the, the normal yeah, right, thing. Right, right. Um, but yeah, so it was on social media primarily. And I started off doing more newsy political things. I strayed away from that just because I've gotten far more disinterested in that. Mm -hmm. um, Why did you lose interest? Because 
I obviously think that politics matter, and I'm interested in politics on like an academic and intellectual level. I think it's interesting. I care about learning about it. But Andrew, By um, but Andrew Breitbart once said, and I think it still holds weight, um, that politics is downstream from culture. And so it starts with culture and the conversations that we're having every single day. And it starts with values. And that's how I was raised. That's what I care about. I care about, you know, looking at trends on social media and saying, why, why is this something that people care about? Um, and I think that we can talk about, you know, social media trends and cultural things in movies and TV and Hollywood without a political angle, but just talking about, like, what is driving these people to believe this way? Mm -hmm. And in my mind, a lot of that goes back to, like, my current critique with my generation i would say is that it's driven by this desperate need for both attention and to victimize themselves um i think that victimization is holding most of my generation back um i think we hold ourselves back a lot of the time um and we know that being a victim these days does give you more attention and so it's things like that where it's like i'm not directly talking about politics and theory and like this new law but I'm talking about things that do by default influence politics. Hmm. Um, and I also think that talking about things that are more cultural and are more value-based, number one, they interest me, but I think that it's it's easier to connect with people on a human-to-human -human level that way. It's less polarizing. I get that. Um, I can have so much more empathy with people, and I think people find me more relatable because of that. And when I'm talking to people who are on opposite sides of the political aisle, that is where we find the most common ground is by talking about this. And then being able to say, like, oh, okay, so now <coughs> I see why you think that the way you do you know, because of this value that you hold or because of this, you know, you know let's talk about it in the context of culture. Um, and you're able to reach so many more people and you're able to find so much more common ground. Um, and I think it makes my content maybe more digestible for people, I would say, because it doesn't come across as like, I'm going to hit you over the hammer. With yeah. like, let's talk about Trump. Let's talk mm -hmm. about Biden. It's like, but don't you think I'm it's also that. easier to talk a little bit more about like drama topics or, yeah. or maybe topics that hit on a more emotional level yes, than exactly. like logical. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And people are driven by emotion these days. And, what, and I've said this publicly before on the show. And I love Ben. And, you know, he's a mentor of mine. And I think, you know, facts don't care about your feelings. It's such a fun, punchy line. But I think, especially with my generation, they don't really care about facts. It's like emotions are dictating so much now. Mm -hmm. Whether that's better or worse, that's something we can all relate on. That's the human-to-human -human connection. And obviously, facts are important at the end of the day. But if you can't reach somebody emotionally, whether that's a positive emotion or a negative emotion, like facts will go out their ear. Mm -hmm. They don't care. And especially in a time when we see so many, you know, whether it's, you know, scientists or politicians, the media lying about facts or changing them, like literally just, you know, saying an outright lie or, get, you know, getting the facts changed in order to fit an agenda or a narrative. It's like, OK, so then if they're doing that then how do we reach people yeah. and with emotion? And that also, as like somebody who comes from like an acting and a storytelling background and why I loved acting so much in addition to it being an escape, was that it allowed me to tap into the emotions that I was too scared to deal with as a child and was too scared to feel or express. And so I really, really understand the importance of connecting to people on that level and mm -hmm. reaching people at that level. Um, and so it makes me happier too. And so as a content creator, I feel more fulfilled in what I'm doing because I read my comments and it's less about people, you know, being fired up about some political policy or being angry at Joe Biden, which gets so tiresome. I don't want to talk about him anymore. It's boring. I do not, I don't want to talk about Trump anymore, whether it's positive or negative, it's boring. Mm -hmm. But hearing people's anecdotal stories and the way that they are emotionally responding to things in the world right now is really interesting to me. And you really understand where people come from.